This week, what is the best way to combat Canada's opioid epidemic? Also, how should Canada deal with asylum seekers from the U.S.? This and much more to come. I'm Glenn McGuinness, and this is Outburst. It's an issue that is on the streets, it's in the back streets, it's something that has a criminal element to it. I think it's shameful that uh, we have Indigenous communities living the way they do in North America. It's an absolute embarrassment. You're trying to come here, you're gaming the system, go home. If you kind of start thinking about the root problem of homelessness, mental health issues are at oftentimes the root, so um, just trying to get programs and funding to help the root cause of the issue. So far in 2019, more than 17,000 asylum claimants have entered Canada by land from the United States, with the vast majority coming in through Quebec. The safe third country agreement between Canada and the U.S., which came into effect in 2004, was designed to better manage the flow of refugee claimants at shared border crossings. But if they cross by land in areas that are not designated points of entry, then they can take advantage of a loophole in the agreement, which means they won't be turned away immediately and their claims will be heard. So are we letting too many claimants in or should it be the more, the merrier? We sent our cameras out across the country with this question. How should Canada deal with asylum seekers from the United States? Yeah, I'd like to see them more set up when they come, like more social services to get them in place, safe housing, um, start getting them jobs, getting them contributing, and there should be programs that help get those people situated instead of just being like landing and saying, here you go, have fun, you're in Canada. I think they should be stopped. They shouldn't be allowed into Canada, plain and simple. You know, there's a rule of law, or there should be, but there isn't because he gets, he brings them in, so he needs somebody to vote for him, right? He's got vets and whatnot that are out on the street. He doesn't do anything for them. Like he said to the gentleman here in Alberta a couple of years ago, I'm sorry, but you're asking for more than we can give. But we can give all we want to everybody else. I think our programs are working quite well because Canada's done a very nice job of integrating newcomers and immigrants. Um, so I'm really proud of Canada for that. Well, Canada is a multicultural country. I think it's fine for uh, people from the U.S. to come here. We do have a lot of immigrants as well here, uh, which I think is fine. And honestly, I think it's good for the country. I think it's uh, immigration. I mean, I'm not a racist, but I, I mean, you should have to speak one of the languages here to uh, be able to come here. And uh, I think you should be educated, because if not, then you're going to be educated here, which is going to cost taxpayers here a lot of money. We welcome people that can contribute to our country. We welcome people, regardless of their religion, their faith, their color, their appearance. And that's how we are as Canadians. We have to respect that. In the same sense, we want them to be contributors. So are you going to contribute by having a young family that's going to grow up to be well-educated? Are you going to come across with a profession? Is your profession going to be recognized? We have to enable that. Let highly skilled people be highly skilled. You really have to walk a fine line there because you can't just say yes to everybody. Um, I think there might be certain instances where there's really a dire situation. Um, but again, I don't know, it's gotta, it's gotta be looked at closely and really monitored and make sure that we're doing the right thing. Why can't we just be that generous country still and be like, come to Canada, we have lots of opportunities here. I think a lot, a lot of it sometimes might be overblown, I guess, but um, I think in terms of how we handle it, it, it should be just like any other uh, first first world country, you know? We've got to treat these people well, but at the same time, we can't be, you know, we can't put them in cages or, you know, there's like a lot of different things. We've got to be civil about it, but at the same time, stern. I think there are people fleeing a terrible places and we should do everything we can to uh, to help them. And there's going to be more uh, with global warming, so... We should, uh, we should open our borders. Not fully open, but we should open, we should be welcoming. Well, I believe that we're a country of, uh, you know, of, of immigrants, but I think they still got to go through the due process. And I don't think that that's been done properly. I don't think the federal government has handled that properly by, you know, just the way that they are screening people, I don't think is, is, is appropriate. 
I think we have to be compassionate. We have to be understanding. Um, but we also have to have uh, thresholds. To tell that we can't allow everybody in. Um, so it has to be reasonable. I don't think they should be allowed in. The United States is a safe third country. Like, don't try to tell me otherwise. It's safe there. People are not being tortured or anything like that. It's the same as it is here. So, quite frankly, you're, you're trying to come here, you're gaming the system, go home. Unless they're being actively persecuted in the U.S. for some reason, like actively, they should be very politely sent back to the States. Well, that's a tough one. I don't really know that I understand all the ins and outs of that situation, although my understanding at the moment is it's not as big an issue as some parties would like us to believe it is. We can deal with them the same way that we've always dealt with them. I mean, you know, you, you let anybody into our country, but at the same time, you need to make sure that they're here for the right reasons. I think if people need help, that then Canada needs to listen, um, uh, you know, about the help that people need. I'm sure every case is different, and I don't think there's, there's a one answer to that either. I think we should accept them with open arms. We need more people. They help our economy. They bring new ideas, new culture. That's a, that's a hard question to answer. You know, I think if they're, if they're legitimate asylum seekers, I think there should be, uh, the process should be streamlined and allow those people to come in for the, uh, you know, where they're coming from. Everything has to be taken into account. It's not just someone, well, I'm going to move to Canada now because of things going on in the States. It's fine to come in, I, you know, I accept, personally, I accept people wholeheartedly. But there has to be checks and balances to see who's coming, background checks, and the way they're being handled. I think that's a big issue with Canadians right now. I think that we should be really look at the individuals on, the, on their own and see that are they really in need of asylum in our country? And if so, we should be doing what we can to accommodate them. But we also need to be very careful when we're looking at them uh, to make sure that we're not letting in, uh, not letting in too many people because we only have so much money really to go around and with all the issues we're having in our country we need to make sure that the people we are helping are the ones that need help the most. The opioid crisis continues to devastate families and communities clear across the country. It affects people of all ages and backgrounds. Between January 2016 and March of this year, nearly 13,000 Canadians have died as a result of overdoses and those numbers are expected to rise every year. The federal government says it's tackling the situation through increased access to treatment prevention and harm reduction. But is this enough? And what more could we do? Our question. What is the best way to combat Canada's opioid epidemic? It would be great if we could somehow eliminate the, I guess the, the demand for the drugs, and I, I, that's both the, the legal and the illegal versions. Um, it seems to me once someone is using opioids, whether again for a legitimate medical reason or, or, uh, or an illegitimate one, um, you've already got a problem and you're, you're now working retroactively to try to correct something that's already taken place. Um, ideally, the, the legal drugs would be dispensed a little more carefully and the illegal drugs would be eliminated entirely at the, at the source, whether that's from other countries or, or from within uh, the, the domestic uh, uh, creation or pharmaceutical capacity. Um, it, it's just too late once the, the problem has already hit a person. We've got to eliminate it before uh, it gets there. Um, ideally, improve social conditions so that people uh, don't uh, go looking for it in the first place. I think it's bringing it out to the open and having it treated medically rather than it being on the street which is where it is right now. There's a lot of examples of countries who have done just that. I believe the Netherlands is one where they've actually made it a medical condition and it's treated with safe controlled pure opiates and it brings the population to a standstill in terms of the crime that they have to commit and the lifestyle they have to live just to achieve the illegal source of drugs. I would say it's uh, the ease of access for the opioids and how, like, when, with mental health on the streets, it's just so easy, like, it's easy to want to get it. And if it's right there and someone's, like, offering it or it, in some way, it'll, it's just going to get to those people much easier. Well, I think it's got to be done in front of the line. Uh, it's an issue that is on the streets. It's in the back streets. 
It's something that has a criminal element to it, and we've got to combat it right on the streets where it's at and where it's happening. Uh, I think decriminalization might be an approach to take. It's worked in other countries like Portugal, where they saw their rates of uh, addiction and death and injury decrease dramatically, and we got to take that approach. You wonder if the, if the safe spaces would, would help, for sure. Um, obviously controlling the substances in, in, in that way. Um, yeah, I think then it's, it's probably a, tr is it a trickle down effect of like mental health and, and poverty and, and all those other pieces. So I think it's, it's, a, it's a multifaceted answer to, to help, help with that. Uh, definitely better education for the people who are um, really in charge of leading that epidemic. So for example, um, doctors who prescribe the opioids and pharmacists and um, just a better education as well for the public understanding um, kind of exactly what these drugs do to people and their effects I guess and if they should be wary of you know whether or not they should be taking them. I would think you probably go right to the drug companies have a word with the CEOs you know greed is uh, taken over so unless them guys are going to get on ball ain't gonna happen. I think the epidemic was created by pharmaceutical companies and by doctors prescribing, thinking or being sold on the idea that this is going to help people. And in reality, when we saw people becoming addicted, nothing was done. And so what's happened is now people are going out trying to find a solution to it. So there's the underground economy and they're selling drugs that are probably opioid based. And that's why people are, are continuing to use it. We definitely need uh, more money put into recovery to support uh, all levels of recovery. So, so we're certainly lacking um, in areas like uh, detox and recovery and support for these. I work in healthcare, so you know these components are, are are lacking. And so the opioid epidemic has to be addressed on a federal level for sure. I really struggle with that one. It's something that I feel bad about because I've been watching a lot of news stories and I've been seeing a lot of these these people that seem to be getting addicted to it are um, it starts off with them being hurt you know they they sprain their back or whatever and then all of a sudden you know the doctor prescribes them the, these opioids and now they're addicted to them and so I'm, I feel really bad about that um, you know and I think we need to do what we can to help these people get over it you know, but again, like, there's only so much you can do about it. And so it's, it makes it hard because, you know, when people are addicted to things, you know, if they want to stop, then sure, great. But a lot of them, it, it feels like they don't want to stop and they just want to keep going and they want me to pay for it. And that's where I draw the line. And, it's, and that's where I say no, too bad. Vancouver has some interesting ideas with, um, uh, a safe haven um, area for people to for drug use because then they can get help there. Uh, I think that does work. That's a tough one again, but again, treatment centers. I think our provincial government is stepping up to the plate right now. They are they are they are working at it, and that's what people don't realize is that there is work being done. There's always can be more work being done, and I don't know what the solution is. I was uh, we've lost a nephew to an opioid over overdose, so. I sympathize with everybody out there, and hey, it's a common problem. It's, I know business people have had common problems with that as well, so it's a, it's a problem that I don't know how you can really solve it, to tell you the truth. It's complex because it doesn't matter what kind of family you come from, good families, it just does, there's just something else that's going on out there, and I think um, people are also not taking responsibility for their life. We want to medicate all the time. We don't want to... I think that's what it is. We don't know how to be responsible for our lives anymore. And there, this, is, this is hard living on Earth. It's not easy. And you can't medicate it away. You just can't. How many members of Parliament were elected to the House of Commons in Canada's first federal election in 1867? 125, 181, 206, 125, 181, I'm guessing 125. 181. 125 is my guess. 181. 125, 181, 206. 125. 125. 181. As a guess. It's 181. Oh, 
but that's fortuitous. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> Thank you. In 1867, at the opening of the first parliament, the House of Commons consisted of 181 seats, 82 in Ontario, 65 in Quebec, 19 in Nova Scotia, and 15 in New Brunswick. As provinces and territories joined Confederation in later years, the number of seats grew, and today there are 338 members from 10 provinces and 3 territories. Winter weather has arrived in many parts of the country, and for some of our homeless population this could prove to be fatal. On any given night, tens of thousands of people in this country are homeless. And although Canada is one of the wealthier nations in the world, we have people in every major city in this country without proper food or shelter. One in seven Canadians lives in poverty. That's roughly five million people. We sent our cameras out to ask Canadians what solutions they may have to remedy this situation. Our question. What more could be done to assist the homeless population in Canada? Oh man, that's a tough one because uh, that's a sad, it's a sad thing. If you come down here at night, it's, uh, it's a different world. Um, I like addiction treatment, counseling, um, make it easier to get access to, um, to services for sure. Uh, I think we can do a lot more. I like to see the pop-up housing that's coming up, um, the smaller homes for people that are homeless. I think that's a great alternative. I think a lot of people that are homeless are have mental health issues which were failing miserably uh, in treating that. I, I know people that have gone through the system and it's a band-aid. It's like short term, it's a week or two and then they kind of punt you out the door. We need something more long term, something that's sustainable and is going to get people to where they need to be but most importantly they need a place to stay, to be warm, to be safe. Absolutely, yes. Absolutely. Especially in this climate, <laughs> we have an obligation. Um, I think we're making headway though. I know Alberta is uh, a forerunner to try to bring homeless, homelessness to zero. So we're getting, getting there. So I, I'm, I'm happy with what we're doing so far. Well, I think there should be more uh, housing for them. Uh, I know the opioid crisis causes a lot of homelessness there, right? Because of, uh, of that, that's a big major one. Um, we should spend more money uh, to get them housing and health care and try and get them off the streets. I think we have to give them the tools to help themselves. I think we have to be better at recognizing those that find it harder to help themselves and give them different tools. But at the end of the day, I think the more we help people instead of just give to people, the better the people that need help end up being. Stop spending our money on all these people crossing the borders and whatnot and start spending it on homeless. I mean, he, they're kicking them out of tents and everything else, but they're putting uh, these other people coming up, they're putting them in hotels and whatnot at our expense. This is ridiculous. And yet he can't build a simple or get, get anything going for the, uh, the Canadian homeless or the vets. You know, I think, you know, we tend to just throw money at things right off the bat. If we have a problem, we just tend to throw money at it. And I think it, we, should, we need to take a step back and look at the root issues and seeing if there's other things you can do that doesn't actually cost money to help alleviate the issue, right? If you kind of start thinking about the root problem of homelessness, mental health issues are at oftentimes the root, so um, just trying to get programs and funding to help the root cause of the issue. I notice uh, certain countries with certain solutions, they use town work, uh, for town work, uh, they use more homeless uh, people to uh, engage in uh, the certain jobs like that. Uh, certain town jobs, like uh, the simple jobs, to, to get them a bit more uh, on track with uh, more of a mainstream, mainstream type of revenue. Well, that actually I was something I really would like to see something done about, because I don't think in a country as rich as ours that we should have people sleeping on the streets, and especially in the winter and the conditions they're in. So I would be looking for a, a federally driven policy to house the homeless, even if even if it just meant building more shelters that they could go to to seek. And not always stay there because some of them apparently don't want to. But there has to be somewhere everywhere in the country for these people to, to be able to get out of the cold and get medical help and stuff. So, I mean there's a lot of food wasted in this province, in this country. There's a lot of different ways that it could be spent and used better. Just more funding and more shelters, more access to people that need um, 
that are in a crisis that you know to get them the support that they need just um, actually get them uh, back on track with the addictions and you know there's a whole area that can be worked on getting an accurate an accurate uh, number of the the homeless in Canada, whether it's here in Newfoundland, whether it's in Alberta, wherever it's too. I think first and foremost, I think that's the first thing that has to be done. There has to be the accurate count. And then there has to be programs put in place to support these people, you know, uh, the, they're the most less fortunate and vulnerable people in the country. And uh, I don't think personally there's enough there's enough being done, Fed, whether it's federal government, provincial government, I don't think there's enough being done to uh, to help those people. So I think with the homeless population in Canada, especially in places that have some brutal and long winters like Newfoundland, we need to start looking at ways to get these people back into uh, back into the workforce. A lot of these people don't have access to uh, services to put out resumes and they're just they're so poor that they can't even enter the workforce and I think the government needs to look at possibly giving some of these people some simplistic jobs or actually working with them to help them get jobs, let the, uh, provide services for them to put out resumes, create resumes, and develop their skills. Something happens in people's lives so that they uh, end up in a situation where they don't have a place to, to, to call home. Uh, so I think trying to understand what those things are, um, are is really important as, as a fundamental solution to that problem. Um, a minimum basic income would probably help in some areas, but people, you know, if there are addiction, addictions issues or if there are mental health in issues, sometimes uh, just throwing money at it isn't going to solve the problem. Poverty in Canada also extends to some indigenous communities around the country. A recent report by the UN described living conditions by indigenous peoples not only here in Canada but around the world as abhorrent. According to the Canadian Poverty Institute, one in four indigenous adults, or 25%, and 40% of indigenous children live in poverty within Canada. So, how do we reverse this cycle? Our question. What could the government do to address poverty in some indigenous communities? I don't think it should be the government's responsibility. I think they've got to take it, they've got to start working on these problems themselves. Throwing money at this time and time again, I'm not for that. Uh, that's all they want is more and more money. I believe, I, I, I'm a strong believer in the indigenous people. I have lots of friends that are, but throwing money at it doesn't seem to be working. Uh, we've seen proof of that. So they've got to solve it themselves. They've got to get together and solve it themselves. They've got to get their people working. They've got to get them educated. And it's got to come within their own people. They got to, the elders have to start working harder with their people. I think a lot of communities, there's not really a lot of opportunity. So it's kind of a dead end. So you've, you've got to make resources or things like that to, you know, so the community can be self-sufficient so that they're not looking for just kind of a handout. That's something I think about a lot, actually. And... Um, <clears throat> They really do have to start evening out the education, uh, what provincial and federal give in terms of education dollars. They have to start giving more resources to those communities. They have to start allowing those communities to come up with um, really strong um, plans, business plans, so they can start creating more business and more uh, stronger economy on, on or in those communities. Uh, those are great ways to start. If they don't, if people there don't feel like they're contributing, they're they're not going to feel like they're a member of society, and they're not going to feel deserving. The government's going to look at them and think you're not deserving. So, yeah, there's a lot of things they have to probably take some steps on, but creating some business and some sort of development on those in those First Nation communities is probably a big big first step. And educating those kids, man, come on, let them let them have what everybody else has in terms of opportunity. I think really it's, you know, getting those people, getting them educated, getting them off to university, uh, trying to de trying to do some development, um, you know, like something, I, I don't know what, but some kind of economic development up there and get them involved in it and get them, um, in, you know, if we can somehow get them some jobs, I think that would, would help greatly. Uh, but there's, 
unfortunately, I don't see an easy answer. I think it's it's going to take a very long time for that because I just I don't see how we're going to make that work. This is going to take generations and generations to fix. I think we give them lots of opportunities. I think it's on the way, but again, it's people being responsible for their lives. I don't know. You can't just keep Medicaid. You just can't, you just can't keep throwing money. That's not the answer. I think actually paying attention to it is is the big one right now. I mean, they seem to talk about it a lot, but uh, they don't really follow through. Uh, so many promises made to the First Nations is, you know, it's very staggering. It's almost as if like uh, you dangle a piece of candy in front of a kid and say, "We're going to do this," and then nothing happens. So. I think just, you know, again, transparency is a big thing with politics. You need to be transparent with the people you're supposed to be working for. Uh, yeah, just do the things you promise to do. Address the issue seriously instead of treating it like an afterthought and, and using it to uh, as a grandstand for a political platform, actually put some work and effort into it. Um, I think it's shameful that uh, we have Indigenous communities living the way they do in North America. It's an absolute embarrassment and I absolutely do not believe that we don't have the funds to sort that out or the resources. I think that's not true. We're seeing more and more Indigenous people in general being educated and understanding how, it's, how to go about to raise capital, to put, invest capital back into their communities. And that capital not just be a fly-by-night, but a capital that's going to grow something and, and grow something that's long, long withstanding of, of all the economic cycles. So that's what I think, you know, really what we can do to help employment for Indigenous people. Now, it might, it might sound a little bit fly-by-night because certain areas have more, more value and certain areas have more resources, certain areas have better people who are educated, certain, certain, resource, certain locations have people who want to work, some don't want to work. So I guess it's also in the same sense getting on that mindset that will drive people away from thinking that somebody else can do it for me but maybe have them the mindset that they should do it for themselves. Thanks for watching this episode of Outburst on the Cable Public Affairs Channel. I'm Glenn McGinnis. If you have any comments or question ideas about this show or any other show, you can find us on social media. You can also find us on our website at www.cpac.ca. It's your turn to speak up, and we're listening.